Hi, Lydia. It's um, it's great um, that you made the time to talk to me. I know you're very busy right now at, at work and uh, with everything you're involved in. So I'm going to be uh, quick. Uh, I wanted to start. Um, it looks like the cases of COVID-19 are on the rise in South Africa right now. Uh, and many specialists, um, I've read some, some articles yesterday, many specialists are saying that the peak of the virus has not hit South Africa yet. And actually, it might just come later on this year. And, and still, we saw a few days ago, people queuing for like four kilometers outside Johannesburg for food. Um, the government has also announced that um, South Africa will slowly go back to work in the next um, couple of days. So in your opinion, is South Africa ready for the tsunami that might hit soon? Yeah, thanks, Frank. I think we are in a very distressing and worrying situation. I know the same in many places in the world. Um, so we had a very hard lockdown for almost six weeks. Um, and we know that in many countries, um, the lockdown looks different. In South Africa, our problem is that about 10 million of our people live in informal settlements. Uh, we know that many millions of people don't have access to, to water. Uh, in their homes. Uh, they're sharing a tap, sharing a toilet with five, six, seven, ten other families sometimes. Um, and these conditions make it very, very difficult to really have a lockdown that's meaningful in very poor environments. Our lockdown did work to a certain extent because the epidemic started as um, a middle class epidemic. So travelers coming in into the big cities. And the, the lockdown uh, was really adhered to in, in, in the suburban areas in, in the country, and people have, have really been committed to the lockdown. So I think we had a little breather for a few weeks um, because that initial lockdown worked. But we know that this came at a terrible, terrible price for the poor in South Africa. Um, we, it's been heartbreaking what we've been seeing, the hunger, um, in, in, uh, in, in poor communities, the failure of the government systems to deliver food in, in any kind of reliable and sustainable way is really historical failure of the state to provide basic amenities to, to many communities in the country. So we have this epidemic now, a crisis on a social crisis, um, and an attempt to really roll out food parcels quickly with systems that don't work. Um, and the way that people have been surviving has been with the microeconomies in township areas, people helping each other in the past or really hustling. Um, and they can't do that now with the lockdown. So, so that's been the social disaster that we've seen with this. So your question of what's coming in the next few weeks, weeks yes, I think the epidemic is still ready to, to, to launch and, and, and pick up. Uh, we hope that the numbers will not go exponential. They are rising, not quite exponential yet, but it's starting to look like the curve is, is deepening. And you, you've spoken about people um, living in very crowded, um, I mean, we call them like, you call them shanty, shanty towns, right? All across South Africa. How do you tell these people to actually physically distance themselves from, from one another in such crowded spaces? Well, you know, as, the, as a member of the People's Health Movement, we've grappled with this question of, of what does lockdown look like in a, in a crowded community. And what we have tried to say is that we need to identify what a household is in this time. So for a middle class uh, suburban house, it might be, you know, five, six people living in a home that might be your family. But household means a different thing in a different community. And that even if we can't uh, distance from one another and your neighbor might be right, right next to you, um, at least we, we limit movement between communities, between areas and between streets to have a more pragmatic approach to, to the physical distancing that we're looking at. You've also asked about whether we are ready for the epidemic which is coming. I think that, you know, despite what we are doing and even though we have a phased easing of the lockdown, I think we're going to see an increase in numbers. We're going to see a massive imp impact on the health system. And our health system is weak and fragmented. 
Um, so we have a, the biggest private health system in the world proportional to our public health sector. So um, even bigger than America, it's hard to believe, but it's true. So 50% so of health expenditure is funneled through private intermediaries, which um, looks after about 15% of the population one to five. Um, and, and within that, we have a very hospital-based health system. So the community primary health care network is weak. In fact, community health workers, which are now being recognized as the key workers that we need on the ground, doing educating, doing screening, encouraging people to test, we have a limited number of these community health workers, and they have historically not been part of the health system, have not been recognized, regulated, paid appropriately, remunerated adequately, and now we're relying very much on, on these health workers to um, be at the forefront of, of managing this epidemic. So, so the political and social um, battles really in our society are, are being exposed. Um, so we say community health workers must do the work, but why are they being paid so little and why are they not being given proper protection and masks and gloves and so on? And those are the kinds of issues that health activists are dealing with. So we support the state in its public health messaging, but at the same time, we are trying to monitor um, to make sure that the response to COVID is a just response, which takes into account the marginalized in our society. Yeah, I want you to go back to this about, uh, you know, South Africa is one of the most, as you've mentioned, unequal society in the world. Um, I was reading yesterday, 3,500 individuals um, own 15% of the country's wealth. And there's also, as you've described again, two parallel health systems. Um, so you were, you were one of the activists fighting against this, uh, against these equality. Um, inequalities. Uh, what are the steps, if there are any, to make South Africa a fairer sort of society? Thanks, that's a big question. I think I'll, I'll talk in two parts. I think to speak on the health system first, um, so a few of, of, our, of the activists we've put together an article on how in this epidemic we can integrate the public and private health systems. Even if we were to say in South Africa nationalize the private sector tomorrow, we're not sure what that looks like. So for now, we know under COVID, we need to integrate our health system so that we don't have a situation where you don't get admitted because you don't have medical insurance, where an ICU bed admission in a private hospital, the criteria is different from a public hospital. We must do away with those things. We must make sure that the medical schemes, as well as the medical scheme administrators, as well as the private hospital groups, make a contribution to the health response so that we don't end up with a bankrupt public department of health at the end of this and the other systems are still functioning. So how do we blur the lines between the two systems in this epidemic is about a combined and integrated response which recognizes that a person is a person regardless of the medical insurance. On society level, um, there are things that can be done right now which will begin to address inequality. Um, some of those, we, we know that the president has announced a 500 to 800 billion um, rescue package. But if you unpack that, where that money is going is not clear and where the money is coming from is even more problematic. But things like a basic income grant, which would be given to every citizen in the country, would begin to make a difference immediately. We know that these things are, are less open to corruption than some of the other mechanisms that have been put in place. Anything which requires people to prove their unemployment or their poverty will inevitably put up barriers. So we, as the C19 coalition, which the People's Health Movement belongs to, are calling for a basic income grant for everybody in the country. We also need transparency about the economic um, processes that are being put into place. What are the deals that are being made with the private health industry? What is the contribution of big corporates in, in this time? Because we're really going into this with a government that over the last two and a half decades has not shown a pro-poor strategy and, and, and remains um, beholden to the capitalist model of doing things. Um, whether they can break out of the psychology in this time, we, we don't know. Um, but some of the demands that might support that would be a basic income grant and a single health system response. And I guess this, this uh, basic income grant would help also a lot of people in South Africa that depend 
on um, informal work, right? And that, that actually cannot stop working even if they're sick. That's correct. I mean, very few people in South Africa can work from home. And, and we have, besides massive unemployment, we have a huge informal sector. So people are going to be working whether or not it is level four lockdown because they are starving. Um, and, and unless we address the social issues, our response will not be sustainable um, and, and therefore will fail. I want to finish uh, with, um, I was reading also that 200 uh, doctors from Cuba uh, arrived in South Africa in the last few weeks. Uh, to support the health system and health workers in South Africa. Do you think the current crisis could, could see maybe a renewal of like the kind of interna internationalism we saw during the um, anti-apartheid years, at least f coming from the South? Yes, I mean, I, th I think, I mean, for us, for me, I, th I think that this, this epidemic will either drive us further into fragmentation or, or it can bring us together because if, if anything, this is something that crosses borders, crosses class, crosses, crosses race. And, and the success of any one nation depends on the success of the weakest and the least um, resourced nations in the world in terms of their health response. Of course, not all governments and leaders understand that, but I think it is, it is the understanding we need to come to. So we welcome that international solidarity we specifically, of course, would also not like to see health worker migration from low resource areas to high resource areas. Uh, South Africa is one country that brings health workers from the continent. And we know that in, in um, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, US and the UK, we export a lot of health workers. So we need that on a global level to have solidarity around this and so that we all support one another in an appropriate way um, and that we realize that um, every health system needs to be strengthened um, out of this epidemic so that we not only come through it, but also are ready for what may come next. Many thanks, Lydia. I'm going to let you go back to work. Uh, Great. Thanks so much. Frank. Thanks a bunch. Okay. okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Bye.